So we're going to start a new series next Sunday um, with a fresh new year. We're going to start a new series. So today is sort of an in-between, sort of a threshold type Sunday. We're at the last part of 2017. We're looking ahead to 2018. And so I kind of want to go to a passage that I think is a great transition passage in the New Testament in the life and the ministry of Jesus. I think it has a lot to teach us about looking ahead uh, after looking behind. Um, and it's something that I've really learned and grown a lot in, I would say, over the last probably nine to 12 months of my life in particular. And the passage we're going to study today kind of brings it to the forefront. Um, the title is Out with the Old, In with the New, kind of that theme of looking back at the year that has come and looking ahead to the one that lies in front of us. So I want to start just by reading the passage we're going to study today in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, and don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. So the end of the year is a time when we generally tend to get a little reflective. We look back at the year that has passed and we ask ourselves, what happened, right? We ask ourselves, what were the highlights of the year? What were the lowlights of the year? What were the disappointments of the year? Maybe if you're like me, you look back and you go, well, I can think of a couple things I would have done differently knowing now what I didn't know back then. And really, a lot of the time towards the end of the year, we start to look at where we've been or what we've been through, and we have to look at it through the new light of a new year, a new set of circumstances. So I actually went through this process myself, a similar process, in a very, very practical um, way, and it has to do with my closet. See, what happened is about two or three weeks ago, I went on an impromptu shopping trip. I had some time to kill between a couple of appointments, and what I should have done in retrospect I should have grabbed a cup of coffee, I should have sat, uh, read some news on my phone, something like that. But instead, I thought to myself, well, I've been wanting a new pair of jeans and a couple of sweaters because it's getting cold and it has, that prophecy has come true because it's, free, it's below freezing now. So I thought, I'll just go in and I'll get myself one pair of new jeans and a couple of sweaters. Well, I was quickly drawn in by what I would call two very powerful magic words, and those words are sale and clearance. It's in my blood, and I simply can't help it. I am drawn to those things. So, so about an hour later, um, I left with two pairs of jeans, three sweaters, two sweatshirts, and a large stack of short-sleeved polo-type shirts that I got for about $3 each. And so I, I came home with my bags of new belongings and uh, was addressed with a very rational yet disturbing question by my loving wife. So you're going to get rid of some stuff now, right? This is how that works. There's new things that come in, so the old needs to leave. And so I did a cleansing, and it was good. As parents, we go through this, uh, really during every Christmas season, right? Because we look at the piles and piles of recently received Christmas gifts that have been given by relatives, friends, very well-meaning grandparents who buy potentially the loudest toys they can possibly find and make you take them home. 
But you look at all those accumulated goods and you look at the boxes and the bins and the closets that already contain all the old toys and you wonder, what now shall I do with this? Well, this situation that we see happening in the transfiguration, if we look deeply enough, we'll see that something like this is actually going on. I I read uh, about this idea in a book that I read this past year by a pastor an author named Brian Zahn, and he has this idea that I think it was great for me, and I hope it's great for you as well. So to go back to the story itself, on the Mount of Transfiguration, we see the themes of mountains and light, and it's important to recognize the importance of them. We're told that this event, of the Mount of Transfiguration, happens six days after another previously significant revelation. And if you back up in the scripture, you'll find that in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, they're referring to when Jesus speaks to his disciples, and he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, has his, his proclamation, you are the Messiah, the Christ. You are the Son of God. And in turn, Jesus says to Peter, oh, Peter, I'm going to build this thing called the church, and you are going to be at the foundation, at the root of that thing. So six days from there, after that big turn in the story, we have this story of the transfiguration. And up on that mountaintop, Jesus, I think, gives what I would call a rare glimpse of his divine nature manifested in his own being. Now, it's true that Jesus was giving glimpses of his divine nature throughout his ministry. Most of the time, they were manifested, though, in the lives of others. Jesus would heal someone. Jesus would drive out Demons and evil spirits. Jesus would feed thousands upon thousands of people. So the recipients, the manifestation is in those people that Jesus touched and healed and cleansed. Now, sometimes it would be closer to his own being when, for instance, he um, walked upon the water or when he calmed the storms, right? But this particular instance is unique in that we see within Jesus' own being a glimpse into that divine nature. And we see this is not just an ordinary human teacher who's really great. This is somebody completely unique. We're told that Jesus' face shone like the sun and that his clothes became as white as light itself. Now, if you're reading this and you have some knowledge of the Old Testament, you're starting, these light bulbs are going off because who else goes up on a mountaintop and ends up having a face that shines? Yeah, so this, this is Moses' stuff. These connections are happening throughout the Gospels. Okay, we see this. I love Mark's account because it says that when Jesus was transfigured, that his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them, is the way we render it in the English. I love that phraseology because it's, that's, that would be me trying to come to terms, what words do I have for this? The best I can do is really bleached clothes. That's how bright Jesus became in this moment. But it's not just Jesus being divinely revealed. Something else happens in the midst of it. And what is it? The appearance of two people, Moses and Elijah. They appear on the scene with Jesus, and then we're told they started having a conversation with Jesus. Now, if you're like me, you have this pocket full of things that you're like, man, uh, somewhere on the other side of eternity, I want to find out this or that or whatever. This is one of mine. Like, I want to know what this conversation was about. Jesus conversing with Moses and Elijah. I remember when the day my wife and I got married, we were up at the front of the church, and my dad and my grandma were singing a song, and so my wife and I started talking to each other, and people later said, I just wish, I just wish I could have known what you guys were saying to one another. And I think they had these dreams that it was like this really romantic conversation, when in reality, we hadn't yet seen one another that day at all, and so we were just saying, hi, good to see you, glad that you could make it, you look really pretty, right? So, so th- but there are conversations that you wish you knew the content, this is one of those conversations, I wish I knew the content of that conversation. Alas, we aren't given that detail. But what I can tell you is for these young Jewish men standing there observing all of this, having their rabbi joined by these two figures would have been, I think, an absolutely mind-blowing experience. And here's why. Think of it this way. They, being, being these Jewish men, they've heard stories, legendary stories about people, about Moses and Elijah. And so now their rabbi, 
is standing there, and he is joined on either side by these legendary people that they have heard about for such a long time. I try to think of ways to have us wrap our minds around their minds in that moment, and I came up with, with a few ideas. Like if you are somebody who's into popular music, maybe, and you know um, some of the best-selling artists of our day, it would almost be like becoming really good friends with Taylor Swift and hanging out with her, and then all of a sudden there appears Elvis Presley and Michael Jackson, two of the other biggest selling musical acts of all time, and you just go, wow, what a moment this is. Or perhaps think of your favorite contemporary president over the last 10 or 20 years, your favorite contemporary president, you're sitting down with that person, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln appear. Somebody from way back and somebody from not quite as far back joined this contemporary person, right? Or maybe sports is a better analogy. Like imagine you're sitting there at a a post-game interview with LeBron James, and all of a sudden Austin Carr and Mark Price show up to join in the conversation. Or maybe baseball is your thing. Imagine you're shagging fly balls with Francisco Lindor, and then all of a sudden Tris Speaker and Larry Doby are surrounding you catching flies, right? Or if football is your thing, maybe you're joined by the legendary Jim Brown, and then you have the not-quite-as-distant-past Ozzie Newsome, and then the present day. <laughs> Every analogy breaks down at some point. But the idea is the same. The idea is that, there, that, that this moment for them would be huge. Somebody from the distant past, somebody from the not-quite-as-distant, and their rabbi are standing there together talking. But what we need to remember is this scene is not a trick. This is not a parlor trick. This is not a stunt or a show for the disciples. It's intended to teach them something important. And if it was just about revealing the divine nature of Jesus, all they really would have needed is Jesus becoming this shimmering person of light. But the fact that Moses and Elijah show up says to us something needs to be learned here in this scene. And we could express it this way. Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets. That's what they're representative of. You have Peter and these two other disciples who are representative of this church idea that's just now being established. And right at the middle of it all, you have the God-man, you have Jesus. So I might put it this way. This scene, among other things, teaches us about the relationships between the law and the prophets, Jesus, and the church. That's what this scene is trying to teach us. How do these things go together? The law and the prophets, what we would call the Old Testament, Jesus himself, and the church. How do these things relate to one another and think about each other? So we have the law, the prophets, and the Christ. So the first question then is, how does Jesus talk about the law and the prophets? What does Jesus do, right? So here's here's a passage from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus speaking about this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to... Not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So the law and the prophets began the work that Jesus will now complete. The law was good, but not complete. It was good in that it took um, the, the Jewish people, God's people, in the ancient world, for instance, the idea of an eye for an eye was revolutionary. Because in the ancient world, it was this constant escalation of violence. If, you, if I plucked out your eye, you'd pluck out both of mine. If I knocked out your tooth, you'd knock out two of mine, and then I'd knock out three of yours. So the idea of an eye for an eye was a limitation. It was a good step forward, but the law was not the completion. Same thing with the prophetic words of people like Elijah. They were good. They were needed. They were very necessary, especially because God's people would often wander into idolatry or injustice, sometimes both at the same time, chasing after other gods or treating their own people or their neighbors completely unjustly. The words of the prophets were good, but they were not the completion. Jesus talks again about law and prophets in Luke chapter 24 as he's walking with his disciples along the Emmaus Road, and they don't quite recognize him yet, but he says to them this, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So on that Emmaus Road, the resurrected Christ 
takes the flow of the law and the prophets, and where does he direct those two things? Right to himself. He will be the fulfillment and the completion. Here's a quote from Brian Zahn that sort of wraps it all together. Jesus, along with the kingdom that he announces and enacts, is where the law and the prophets find their fulfillment. The transfiguration is where Moses and Elijah find their great successor. The transfiguration is where the Old Testament hands the project of redemption and restoration over to Jesus. The law was good, but it wasn't complete. The prophets were good, but they were not the fulfillment. Those things, and I love the phraseology, they they hand off to Jesus the restoration and the redemption. So now that Jesus has arrived, and, and this scene arrives in sort of a new way in the transfiguration, we have questions we need to ask, right? The advent of Jesus is here in a new way. That's the, the word advent actually just means arrival. And so with the transfiguration, Jesus is sort of arriving in a new way. He's revealing a a new facet of himself to his disciples. And the truth is this. With the arrival of Jesus like this, the law and the prophets must be re-examined and must be re-evaluated. And as Christians, we already do this in a vast number of ways. But I want to unpack a few so we get on the same page with where this trajectory is taking us. So here's one. Hebrews chapter 10. We've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. I, I could preach an entire sermon just on that, but just on the last phrase that those who are made perfect are being made holy. But what do we learn about this particular thing today from that passage? We learn this. As Christians, we have ceased the kinds of sacrifices required by the law because Jesus is the only sacrifice that is sufficient. Moses would disagree. On the surface, the, the law of Moses said these sacrifices are necessary and good And they are part of the way things work. But as Christians, we have set that aside. Why? Because of Jesus. And I want to stress, as Christians, because you can be a a Jewish person, for instance, with no interest in Jesus as Messiah, and you can debate Moses, Elijah, Jesus. But as a Christian, you have said, no, no, I'm staking my claim in Christ himself. So there's one example. Here's another one. Mark chapter 2 story about Jesus and his disciples. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, which is an audacious claim in his day to say that you are above the Sabbath. There are multiple problems there because it's the picking of the grain, but also just walking. You can only walk so many steps on Sabbath according to laws, rules, and regulations until you are breaking the Sabbath. So Jesus is confronted, why are your disciples not obeying the law? They're not obeying Moses. And Jesus redirects them. And we learn this, as Christians, we have ceased the kinds of Sabbath laws and interpretations observed by God's people for generations, because the authority of Jesus is greater than Sabbath fidelity. Jesus claimed, I am the Lord even over the Sabbath. So all these Sabbath laws and regulations in Christ have been set aside. Here's another one, Matthew chapter 9. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And this is such a loaded story, right? Jesus going into this uh, home of Matthew, the tax collector. Jesus is breaking so many purity laws, you can't even count them at this point. Laws, rules, and regulations, breaking all of them. And I love it that the Pharisees question the disciples. Why? Why are they doing this? But Jesus, overhearing it, I think, says, I'm going to answer this question myself because it's that important. And he says, look, (laughs) Look what he says, go and learn this. You say to a Pharisee, go and learn this, that is one of the biggest insults you can imagine. They thought they knew everything. Go and learn this. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's the sick who need the healing. But according to the law, according to Moses, they weren't wrong. Jesus was doing things that would have made him unclean according to the law reminds us that as Christians, we have ceased obedience to the laws and customs associated with Old Testament understandings of purity. Jesus addressed the reality of the sickness of sin, not by backing away, but by drawing near. According to laws, traditions, and codes of Jesus' day, the proper thing to do and with that level of sin going on is to get as far and as fast as you can. But instead, Jesus redirects the whole thing, and he goes near to those who need the healing. Here's another one, Matthew chapter 5, part of the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Jesus loved to use this phrasing. You have heard it said, but I say to you. In fact, I counted as I was doing this study just here in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus uses that type of phrasing six times. You have heard it said, but now I am saying to you something different. It's a reminder to us that as Christians, we must allow the teachings of Christ to guide our journey into the Old Testament commands and decrees. Because when Jesus said, you have heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, that's in Leviticus or something. I mean, that, he's quoting Torah for them. You've heard it said, but now I say unto you. Jesus sometimes brought the Old Testament itself under the microscope. Most of the time, he brought the accumulated traditions, the accumulated extras that were tacked on under the microscope. Which, as I was reading this and studying it, made me realize, you know, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus was on the earth and taught these things. It's been 500 years since the start of the Protestant Reformation. It's been almost 250 years since Christianity started to take on uh, the cultural surroundings of Americanism. Is it possible, maybe, that in that amount of time, there has been some accumulation of tradition that needs to be sort of cleared away, right? It's like the snowball that starts at the top of the hill in the cartoons, and it rolls down and gets bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. One more example, Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 55. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. And when the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord... Do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Anybody ever read that story and thought, what is going on? I mean, they they ask for preparations and the people are unwelcoming. and, And in response, James and John say, you know what they need? They need some fire from heaven judgment to fall and destroy them. To us, it looks harsh and shocking. But from their perspective, and I want to be clear, they were offering Jesus a potential biblical solution to the events that were transpiring because they're remembering back to 2 Kings chapter 1, a story of Elijah. I encourage you to read it this week, but I'll give you the recap. There was a king in the northern kingdom of Israel, actually in Samaria, which is another touch point for this, who was injured. He was gravely injured, and he wondered if he would survive. 
And so he decided to consult the wisdom of an oracle, but instead of sending for Elijah, he has some messengers go to Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron. Baal Zebub, does that sound familiar? Baal Zebub, we eventually get there. That's a whole other tangent. I'd love to take you on, but we don't have time this morning. Essentially, though, he sends his messengers to consult this foreign pagan god. Elijah hears the voice of God speak to him, and God says, Go and meet these messengers before they get there. And tell them to go back and give a message to the king. And the message is essentially this. Is there no God in Israel that you would send people to this God of this particular place instead? So the king gets the message and he asks, what did the guy look like? Uh, well, he was kind of hairy. And like, ah, oh, he, knew, he knew it was Elijah. And so in response, he sent a captain and 50 military men to bring Elijah in to discuss the matter. The captain arrives with the 50 men. The captain calls up in all of his authority, Elijah, come down from there. Elijah says, if I am a man of God, let fire fall from heaven and consume you. And guess what happens? It falls. The king tries again, sends another captain, another 50 trained military men to get Elijah down. This captain arrives with even more force and says, come down now, the king wants to speak with you. Elijah again says, if I'm a man of God, let fire fall from the heavens and consume all of you. And you know what happens? It falls again. The king, undeterred, sends another captain, another 50 trained military men. But this guy, this captain, has heard the previous story. So he gets to Elijah and he says, Please, man of God, please, please have mercy on us. Please spare our lives. These men have children. And he pleads, and finally Elijah says, Fine, I'll come with you. He goes to the king. He delivers the message himself. But you can see why, can't you? James and John would go, you know what we need? We need a little Elijah moment right here. We need the fire to fall from heaven to consume those who are unwelcoming of Jesus. Jesus, what do you think? And what does Jesus say? I don't don't think so. I don't think so. Same type of story, but on a personal level, happens in John chapter 8, one of my favorite stories in all the New Testament. Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Here's the important thing to remember in that beautiful story. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were not wrong. According to the law, according to Moses, they were not wrong. The punishment for that kind of crime was indeed death by stoning. So you can question their motives, and you should. You can question their victimization of this woman, and you should. You can question why wasn't the man brought along with the woman, and you should. But the one thing you can't question is whether or not what they were proposing was a biblical solution, because it was. And what does Jesus say? I don't think so. I don't think so. Reminds us of this. As Christians, the arrival of Jesus means a fresh understanding of what the judgment of God looks like. And I'll give you a hint It doesn't look like fire falling from heaven to consume those and destroy those who are not welcoming, and it doesn't look like stoning to death. It looks like something new. 
So if we're on the same page, now let's go back to the story. Because what happens is, in this moment, Jesus and Moses and Elijah, there's one disciple in particular who gets really excitable, and it's Peter. And Peter has what he thinks is a great idea. Now keep in mind, Peter has not been known in the gospel stories to have the best ideas, right? During the storm and Jesus walking on the water, who was the one that looked and said, oh yeah, I'll try that? Peter. Who was the one in the garden when Jesus is being arrested said, you can't take him, and chops off the ear of someone? It's Peter. So Peter, in this moment, says, I have a great idea. Here's what we'll do. We will build three shelters for these three heroes. My rabbi, Jesus, Moses, Elijah, will build three shelters and will stay here for a while. And on the surface, we get it. Don't we get it? Haven't we been in situations where it felt like God was so near and so real and so bright and so God with us that we have said, I don't want this moment to end. I want to stretch it out as long as I possibly can. That's a little bit of what Peter's doing here. Let's build shelters. Let's stay here a while because it's so good for us to be here. And in response to this idea, we're told that a thick cloud covers them and a loud voice speaks, terrifying Peter and the other disciples to the point that they fall down on their faces in fear. The request to build these shelters was met with a message that affirmed the identity and the authority of Jesus. A loud voice, a heavenly voice, the voice of the Father saying, This is my Son, and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And you might think, what does that have to do with what's going on? That's not an answer to the question. I mean, essentially, if you look at it, Peter asked a question that I think, maybe we can all agree on this, maybe not. This is the first church building project. Let's put up some shelters. And Jesus rejects that, but not by saying no, because there's this heavenly voice that says something entirely different. Here's the problem with Peter's request. It's not necessarily that you want to extend the moment. The problem is, by suggesting three shelters, it's putting Jesus on equal footing with Moses and Elijah, putting Jesus on equal footing with the law and the prophets, and the Heavenly Father would have none of that. No. We will not be building three shelters. We will not be putting my son on the same level as these heroes that have come before him. But, and this is where I sort of want to land the plane today for us, I think, at least I've looked at my life and I know, we still drift toward toward what I would call three shelter thinking today. We still want three shelters. Here's what I mean by that. Have you ever wanted revenge on someone? Have you ever had somebody do something to you that you thought, boy, I wouldn't mind if they suffered similarly, and I wouldn't mind if I was the person that got to deal out the revenge that I think they need to suffer? Then guess whose shelter, guess whose tent you want to be in? Moses' tent. That's the shelter that you're looking for. Or maybe you have been disrespected. Maybe you have been threatened. Maybe you have been opposed or unwelcomed. And you have thought, I just wish God would deal with them and deal with them harshly. Then guess whose tent you want? You want Elijah's tent. That's the shelter you're looking for. And it comes down to this hard truth. We are, when we are uncomfortable with what Jesus taught or what Jesus did, We tend to retreat back into the law and the prophets to find justification for our actions, our emotions, and our desires. When we want revenge, we want to find the tent of Moses. When we want fire to fall and consume some people, man, we want Elijah's shelter. 
Now, you can take this way, way, way too far. There's a, a famous heretic, Martian, in the early church, and he wanted to go so far as divorcing the Old Testament from the New, saying, leave it behind. And he was rightfully kicked out of the church for it because the Old Testament has so much beauty, so much wisdom, so much life to offer. You don't throw it completely out. Certainly not. But it's interesting that in that moment, the idea of three shelters is completely rejected. The voice of God speaks. And then the hand of Jesus, I love it, the voice of the Father, the hand of the Son reaches out, touches those men, says, get up and don't be afraid. And when they finally have the strength and the courage to stand up and open their eyes, who do they see? Only Jesus. Listen to him. Which leaves us with a question, are we going to be okay with only Jesus? So three things to think about as we finish our time together. Here's the first one. Are there any teachings or actions in Jesus' life that trouble you, and what do you do with them? When Jesus says, don't resist an evil person, turn the other, treat, other cheek, and you go, whoa, wait a second, what do you do with it? You can't unsay it for Jesus, so what do you do with things like that? Secondly, are any of your actions or emotions or desires rooted more in the law or the prophets than in Jesus himself? And third, take a moment to pray today. Pray that any influences in your life that compete with Jesus for understanding how to live and love will be exposed and returned to their proper places. The law was good, the prophets were good, but they were not the completion, they were not the fulfillment because that only happened in Jesus. So take a moment or two to pray. If you want to close your eyes, bow your head. If you just want to read over those words, Seek after the leading of the Spirit, and then I'm going to close this with prayer in just a moment or two.